Two Lost Worlds, a thrilling movie today. Brace yourself for an epic adventure. It's a roller coaster of excitement that you won't want to miss. Grab your popcorn for Two Lost Worlds. Let the adventure begin. August 16, 1830, the Hamilton Queen sailed from Salem on her maiden voyage, bound for the East Indies. This was an era when the whole world stood at a new threshold of commerce and communication between nations. The story of this vessel is a vital chapter of America's rise to prominence in that era, the historical hour of the clipper ships. Laden with American goods, the queenly vessel slipped from the harbor to which she would bring back the treasured produce of the Orient. As she rode the outgoing tide, the tides of fortune for the young American Republic flowed with her. With speed that was never equaled in the days of sail, the clipper skimmed over the wide blue waters. It was the clipper ship that won America's place in the race between nations for trade and wealth. Yes, the Hamilton Queen carried far more than the valuable cargo and the hold below her rolling deck. She carried the American dream of destiny, and she carried the dreams of men who took in their hands the wheel of destiny men like young Kirk Hamilton. His was the vision and courage of the seafaring Yankee pioneer. He knew the dangers that faced the pioneer, but his was the energy and the enterprise that ignored the danger and achieved the dream. 86 days out of Salem with a fair wind, the fate of a nation and the fate of Kirk Hamilton was bound up in his ship. Bound around Cape Horn, across the Pacific, and westward to the fabulous fortune-laden Indies, outward bound for destiny. Eighteen days ahead of our original charted course, Captain Tallman. Aye, Mr. Hamilton. The Clipper certainly justified your new design and proven her worth. She hasn't proven anything yet, Captain. How do we take on the last of our cargo in the East Indies? Deliver it on the Salem docks ahead of competitive shipping companies. Well, barring unforeseen trouble and weather permitting, we should be in the East Indies in about six weeks. Five. Five if we nose her through the New Hebrides Islands. That's risky, son. Too many seizures in those waters. Ah, there isn't a pirate ship afloat that can keep this clipper's sails in sight for 24 hours, Captain. Much less border. That's still taking a big chance, Kurt. Dad took a chance on us, Captain. His company and everything he owns is tied up in this voyage. If we're not the first ship back in Salem, no contract. That'll mean no more ships sailing under the Hamilton flag. You're a very persuasive mate, Mr. Hamilton. It's a very important voyage, Captain. Chart the course as you see her, mate. Thanks, Captain. Confound it. I never can keep any cigars around here. Salty! 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 Captain? Mr. Hamilton? Put it on the table. By the way, Salty, I had some cigars around here this morning. Uh, you didn't see them when you cleaned my quarters, did you? Who, me? Uh, oh, no, sir. Good. I was just going to throw them out. They're poison. Poison, sir? Excuse me, <coughs> Captain. I, I don't 
feel very good. I don't care. She'll be missing any more cigars. <laughs> At least not until tomorrow. Forget to me, Captain. Man the sail. Bail up. Bail out! Get in on them when we clear the fog bank. Aye, Captain. She's a pirate vessel, the Phantom. Main battery of nine pounders. Secondary battery of six pounders, mounted on the forecastle and quarter deck. We won't be able to battle her, but can outrun her. You want to test the speed of the clipper? Here's your chance. All right. Have the men crowd on the sail. Run out the guns and get every man to his station. I'm going forward. Aye, aye. Shape, mate, but don't try to talk. Tell me about her. She left the pirate ship last night like she had wings for sails. Painies, didn't he, son? I'll be a big side in short order, Captain. No use fooling yourself, Kirk. You've got a nasty splinter in that left leg. We can't remove it. You need medical attention, so we're dropping anchor at Queensland. I can hold out till we reach the East Indies, Captain. Our destination is Queensland, mate. That's an order. <laughs> Under a full head of sail, the clipper veered southward from her course and raced with the wounded Kirk Hamilton for medical help. Four days later, she arrived at a tiny harbor on the coast of northeast Queensland and dropped anchor. The disturbing news of her escape spread quickly. This community had been attacked before by the pirates, whose return was greatly feared by the peaceful settlers. But they welcomed the Yankee seamen as fellow pioneers, and in a simple shack, Kirk Hamilton was made as comfortable as his painful injury permitted. How is he, Doctor? Can't tell. I couldn't remove all the splinter. He's lost a lot of blood. How long will it be before you'll be able to remove the rest of it? Another week, maybe two. It depends. Besides, he should stay here under observation for at least a month. Blood poisoning. You'll have to ship out without me, Captain Tolman. Is that the way you want it, son? That's the only way it can be, Captain. What happened?
establish the clipper in her cargo right now is more important than what happens to one man. We can't afford to lose even one day. I wanted to hear it from you, Kurt. I knew you'd want it that way. We can pick up the rest of the cargo in the East Indies and stop for you on the way back to Salem. It'll take two months. I'll be waiting, Captain. I'll leave Salty and Mercer here to take care of you. You'll need them. That's an order, son. Besides, <laughs> with Salty here, I'll be able to smoke one of my own cigars for a change. Thanks, Captain. Right, mate. Yes, the news spread quickly throughout the little Australian settlement. And to men like Martin Shannon, a sheep rancher, the arrival of the Yankee Clipper in the story of her running fight with the pirates brought a very serious problem. The presence of the Sea Raiders threatened to disrupt the operation of the ranch. And to Martin Shannon, his ranch was of first importance. Here too, as in America, a new civilization was being built on a primitive frontier. Here, where wild kangaroos hopped among the fields, the land was forced to yield to the farmer and the rancher. The land meant security and the bright hope of the future. But the colonists sent their wool and mutton to the Western world by only one route, the sea. Now their very homes, as well as the sea lane, were threatened by the pirates. While the men worked diligently in the pastures and sheds, their minds dwelt on the danger to their homes and families. Nerves became tense and tempers grew sharp. We should have government yeah, just, right. Right. All right, just, All right, just a minute, man. One at a time. Now, what is it, Jackson? If the Americans were fired upon by the same pirate ship that raided our colony last year, then we might be in for more trouble, and soon. Why aren't these men at work? The men are worried, Mr. Shannon. Worried about what? But the raider ships are close. They feel it isn't safe here without government troops. So? Unless the magistrate does something, they're moving back to the city. I see. Well, men, Magistrate Jeffries is on his way right now to Brisbane to request the governor's help. I just saw the American ship, and she's ready to sail. Now, if any of you men are afraid, get out. But if you're the men I think you are, you'll stay. And you'll forget this nonsense and get back to work with the rest of the men. Let me have those shares. Yeah, I well, think we better stay. Come on, go back and think about it. Say about it, then. Yeah. All right. Here you are, Janice, and he's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Shannon. It's all right. <laughs> Come on, little fella, you need a bath. I plan on going to Brisbane for a couple of weeks on business. How oh, wonderful. You do want to go, don't you? Yes, Martin. I... Hello, Miss Elaine. Mr. Shannon. Oh, hello, Mr. Hartley. Hello, John. I just came up to tell Mr. Davis I saw the government sloop off the point. Father's coming home. He should be here shortly. Oh, excuse me, Martin. <laughs> don't forget to ask him, though. Father's coming home, Mr. Davis. Yes, and I'll be glad to see him, too. It's been three long weeks since he went away. There you are, magic, all clean. A little perfume, and you'll smell like a lady. Oh, Janice, what in the world are you into now? I wash magic. Look at yourself. Just look at yourself. And Father's coming home. Hurry, put it down now. Gotta change your clothes. He'll be right here. Shortly. Oh, I'm just dying to see how Mr. Shannon will like your new clothes. Oh, you're such a lucky girl. Thank you. Elaine. Elaine, I just saw the Yankee sailor. So? <sighs> what about it? The way he smokes. The way he smokes? It's the way he holds it, Elaine. Oh, and the way he walks. The way he walks? Yes, he limps a little. He limps? The way he limps, Elaine. I don't care if he does limp. I think he's great. Janice! I don't care. I'm going to marry Mr. Hamilton. You're what? Why not? After all, I'm almost ten years old. Janice, aren't you ashamed to talk about a man like that? Oh, you girls are old-fashioned. Welcome home, Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> Daddy! Daddy! Oh, oh, oh. Babe, have you hurt oh, yourself? Daddy, I missed you so. Mm -hmm. Is that my new doll? Why don't you open it and find out? Oh, thank you. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, welcome home. My, how well you look. Traveling must agree with you. Well, girls, there you are. The latest from Brisbane. <gasps> I can't oh. 
And I've missed them. Has the situation here eased any, Davis? No, sir. The people are still disturbed and frightened. Are we getting any troops? I've done the best I could. The governor refused? No, not exactly. He's promised to do the best he can. He's even promised to come here himself and investigate our situation. He's going to establish a garrison for our protection once and for all. But when? Promises don't help us now. There's talk, sir, that if something isn't done soon, the people will move back to the cities. We'll try to formulate a temporary plan of defense. Call a meeting of the council here tomorrow evening. Yes, sir. What's in the basket? Oh, something. Where are you going? Oh, places. <laughs> It's going to be the finest ship afloat. Come in. Well, hello, Janice. Hello, Mr. Salvi. Hello, Mr. Mercer. Happy birthday, Mr. Hamilton. Happy birthday? Well, how did you know? Mr. Salty told me. He said it would be nice if I brought a cake and we had a party. I see. Say, that's a beauty. Who baked it? I did. With a little help of my sister. Oh. Uh, you didn't tell us you had a sister. Well, why didn't you bring her along? Is she older than you? Yes, but you wouldn't like her. No? No, she's big and fat and knock-kneed and uh, bull-legged and ever so silly. Well, I'm not so particular. Thomas, how dare you talk like that? You'll have to excuse my sister. Come along, young lady, you're going home. Excuse me. After all, Salty did promise her a party. I, I'd hate to see him break that promise. Won't you join us? <laughs> sure, then we could have a real party. You said it. Well, I, I should be going. Please stay. My name is Hamilton, and these are my two shipmates, Salty and Nat. How do you do? Hello. So you're Mr. Hamilton. I've heard a lot about you from Janice. You're talking behind my back, young lady. Have I? Well, what are you standing there for? Get a bucket of water. We'll brew up some tea. Wait a minute. How about you getting the water for a change? I've got plenty to do here. I think we need some flowers. Come on, baby. I'll be right back, Mr. Hamilton. I, I want to apologize for the way I... Well, I stormed in here. I must have seemed rather awful. I didn't think so. On the contrary, it was a very pleasant surprise. Yours? That's the next ship I plan to build. How is it with men who build ships? I mean, do you form an attachment for the ships you build, or, or do you feel the same for each one? Well, there's an attachment you feel for every ship you build. When you see her slide down the ways, take shape on the water. But isn't there one ship above all the others that's your favorite? Yes. The first one. It's like a first love. You'll never forget her. Why do you talk about a ship as her? Well, to a seagoing man, she's a lady. Beautiful, graceful, proud and spirited. Trim lines. And when you have a real ship like a real lady, you know you're safe in her arms. You talk as though you might marry one. Five minutes ago, I might have. Do you always talk like this, Mr. Hamilton? Not always. Hello, Mr. Shannon. How's Hamilton? Oh, just fine. We're all fine. Matter of fact, we're beginning to enjoy your place. What changed your mind? Well, we're having a party down at the cabin. Tea and cake, all the trimmings. And the magistrate's daughter. Janice? And her sister. It's a big one. Elaine? Yeah, that's her. We've been waiting for you, Mr. Shannon. Did you have all the men ready? They're inside. We'll be with you in a minute, John. Right. Well, so long, Mr. Shannon. If you get a chance, drop up. I'll introduce you. Oh, Janice. 
Why don't you say good night to Mr. Hamilton and run along? I'll be there in a minute. Good night, Mr. Hamilton. Good night, Janice. And thanks for that birthday cake. You're welcome. It's been a wonderful evening, Mr. Hamilton. Kirk. All right, Kirk. Will I see you tomorrow? Maybe. Why don't you come in now? I know my father would like to meet you. You think so? Very well. It'd be a pleasure. I ask you to share my confidence with me in the future. Now let us all reach a definite plan that will satisfy each of us. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. Come in. Please be seated, gentlemen. Come in, honey. Father, this is Mr. Hamilton. It's a great pleasure, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Shannon, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, we've met. And Captain Allison. How do you do, sir? How do you do? If you'll excuse me, Father, I'll put Janice to bed. I didn't mean to interrupt, sir. If you'll excuse me, I'll leave. No trouble at all. Sit down. I'd like to have a chat with you after the meeting. Uh, take this one. Thank you. It seems to me, Magistrate, that if the governor can't send troops now, he'll never be able to. That's right. I don't know what all you men are so worried about. After all, pirates prey on ships at sea, not on land. They did invade our colony once before. Could happen again. Gentlemen, yeah. gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if I might suggest. Why not organize your own militia, sir? We do in America. The Yankees, right. That's what we need, it's our militia. own militia, a plan. How do we go about it, Mr. Hamilton? I'll have a general signal in case of invasion. Meet at one central point and fight as a unit. Mr. Hamilton makes sense. Such a plan would take time and men away from their work. It needn't. The plans can be worked out by one individual. The important thing is that everybody knows the plan. Sounds exactly like what we need. Would Mr. Hamilton assume the responsibility of developing such a plan? You have my heartiest approval. Why not begin at once? Is there some central location on high ground close about? Cavanaugh Peak. Well, it would be best to start right there. You can take one of my mounts. We'll all meet on Cavanaugh Peak at the pass. <laughs> going with the others? Yes, but I thought I'd stop for a few moments to uh, tell you how beautiful you are. Especially so tonight. Well, thank you, Martin. Elaine, I've decided to announce our engagement before we leave for Brisbane. Martin, we agreed to wait. Is there any reason why I shouldn't announce it? No. I... Well, it's just that I see no reason to change our plans now. Since this Mr. Hamilton has come into our lives, uh, you've changed. I hardly know you. My Martin. I think you're jealous. Of course I'm jealous. Why shouldn't I be? I love you and I always will love you. Don't let a momentary infatuation make you do something foolish. He's from a different world. He has his home and his obligations. Your home is here with us, with your father, Janice, and me. I'm aware of my obligations, Martin. I always will be. He'll be leaving soon. Can't you see that it won't work out? I see no reason to change our plans now. Well, maybe at the dance you might feel differently about it. Let's talk about it then. But the plans of Elaine Jeffries did not reckon with the plans fate had drawn for the young American. Nor did Elaine reckon with her own heart. She did not reckon with the springtime. And springtime in Queensland is just the same as springtime anywhere in the world. There is the same bright sunshine in the fresh green on the hills. The quickening pulse in the earth is the same. The fragrant caress of the wind is the same. The stirring life is the same in the trees, in the flowers, in the birds of the air. And a man and a woman are the same. Mates are enjoying your stay? We are, sir. Good. Tell me, 
Have you ever kissed the Blarney Stone? Have I ever kissed the Blarney Stone? <laughs> and the Blarney Stone is not all I'm going to be kissing. Cloudy, your eyes getting salty. Honey, you go tell Elaine that I want to see her, will you? All right. <laughs> well. <laughs> Let's dance, Captain Salty. There's so many people around. Really? I hadn't noticed. You're the only thing I've seen all evening. Did I ever tell you I loved you? Oh, just a thousand times this past week. Oh, Kirk. Oh, Kirk, when you find someone you really love, it is a great discovery, isn't it? You're suddenly warm and alive. And happy. Oh, it sounds silly, doesn't it? No. No, when two people make a discovery like this, it's important. It's more important than who they are or where they're from or anything else. Look, Elaine, my ship's coming back in a couple of weeks. I want to take you home with me. But you're home so far away, Kirk. I'd never see my family again. It isn't that I don't... Know. Is it Shannon? Oh, I'm very fond of Martin. Yes, but you don't love him. No. But we grew up together, and it just seemed natural that someday... Kirk, I don't know what to say. What is it to say? We belong together, Elaine. I love you, Kirk. I want you to stay. There's so much to be done, and we could be happy here. I have to go back, Elaine. A lot of people are counting on me. Their entire future is staked in this voyage of mine. My life's on the sea. I can't give that up. What about my life, Kirk? Oh, Elaine, I... Come on, I'll take you home. I have to go back. A lot of people are counting on me. Their entire future is staked in this voyage of mine. My life's on the sea. I can't give that up. I love you, and I always will love you. Don't let a momentary infatuation make you do something foolish. He's from a different world. He has his home and his obligations. Your home is here with us, with your father, Janice, and me. Hi, Captain Hackett. You men know why we're here. We haven't boarded a vessel in a long time. I want to see the decks of the Phantom loaded by dawn. Are the horses ready? We got the best stock that we could find. They're in the corral. Over there. Look what we found. Prowling around back there. You know what to do with them. Yes, sir. Come on. All right, shove off. Yeah. Party. Huh, Wilson? I say. Best one I've seen around here. Oh. Which one of you forgot to close the gate on the horses? We didn't leave it open, Mr. Shannon. Well, it's open now. And the horses are gone. Go get them. Yes, sir. And be sure to get them all back in the corral. Is Mr. Shannon in there? Yes, ma'am. Elaine, what are you doing here? Martin, you were right. My place is here with you. I want you to take me to Brisbane. We'll go next week. No, Martin, now. All right. Tomorrow. Serrated. They're surrounding us. I've got to get her out of here. Wilson, you go out the front and draw their fire. John, you cover us from that window.
Get back on your horses and head him off. The magistrate's only thought was for Elaine and Jana. Momentarily evading the attackers, he galloped furiously to seek the two girls. Jeffrey's horse, seeming to share his urgency, ran as though pursued by the devil himself. And devils they were, clamoring hot upon his heels. The magistrate was riding for his life and knew it. of devastation and death, the evil crew of the Phantom fled to their ship and put to sea. The settler, who first had been captured by the invaders and then left for dead, feebly told Kirk and the others that the pirates had taken Elaine and Nancy aboard the Phantom. The magistrate is dead. Your homes are burned. You're not going to stand idly by and do nothing. We've got to go after them. He's right. Your sloop, Captain Ellison, is our only chance to catch that raider ship. But I have no authority to undertake such a mission. I'd have my ship's commission taken away from me. And besides, she has a small crew and no guns. We'll get you additional men and all the guns and ammunition you need. Just give us permission to board your sloop, Captain Ellison. What if one of those girls was your daughter? What would you do? Oh, hang the orders. We'll go. You get your men and guns and ammunition. Have the men stand by to pull anchor. On the double. I'll see you at the landing. <laughs> Anything yet? Nothing. The mate wants a crew to eat in shifts. You probably fixed it so you eat in the first one. Yeah? Ah, oh, just one. Do you see what I see? Salty. Oh, Janice. Janice, I'm only glad to see you, but here. Mr. Shannon. Mr. Hamilton. Why, well, Janice, what are you doing here? My daddy told me that if anything ever happened, I should hide. So I thought I would be safe here. Where's my daddy? Well, you see, Janice, your daddy and all of us were out fighting, and we... Why uh... isn't my daddy here? Where's Elaine? Look, honey, we'll tell you all about that later. Right now, how about something nice to eat? How about a nice hot bowl of soup, huh? Salty has it already. I could use a bit of a meal myself. Will it be, Salty? Well, we have soup and... Uh... Cheese and, uh, cheese. Well, Janice will have a bowl of soup. I really don't feel like eating, Mr. Hamilton. <laughs> well, what are you standing there for? You eat with the second shift. You must be proud of yourself, Captain. Looting, killing, preying on innocent victims, then hiding on the sea like the spineless creature you really are. I always thought I'd be afraid to face a man like you. Well, maybe these parasites you call men are afraid, but I'm not. I feel sorry for you. You're nothing but a... Set our course for the nearest land. I don't care if it's in the middle of nowhere, but get them off my ship. Now get them out of here. Throw them below. Seems to be changing her course. That may be to our advantage. How do you figure? Well, as long as we can keep her in our sights, we're all right. We're getting closer. She's about two hours away. That gives us plenty of time to chart our strategy. Make sure that every man knows his station. Pounders will blast her out of the sea. As long as the fog holds, they can't bracket their fire on us. Aye. The Saints are with us, Hamilton. Now, men, I don't have to tell you what you're up against. You know. You've seen these men fight. They've got no rules. Don't give them a chance. All right, to your stations. Hold her steady. Up with the anchors! All right, 
right, Salty. Take your men and swim underneath the water to the other side of the ship. Climb aboard and draw their attention away from us. Hamilton's small boatload of survivors slipped away from the doomed vessels into the darkness as the savage battle roared to a flaming climax behind them. Into the immense arms of the dark sea, through the cold night, they rode and drifted aimlessly, without compass or chart, at the mercy of wind and current. Through a blistering day and another night, they drifted helpless. Then on the second day, they sighted land. Only an island, perhaps, but land. Wearily, they managed to bring their small boat through the turbulent surf of a strange shore. The castaways straggled from the boat, exhausted by exposure to chilling wind and tropical sun, from which their meager clothing gave little protection. They faced their desperate situation, and desperate it was. With two frightened women and the child, and with Shannon wounded, Kirk Hamilton knew that he and John Hartley must bear the burden of their survival. Grimly, his eyes met the glowering, forbidding aspect of a barren and desolate landscape. Harsh and cruel, it conveyed a silent, brooding menace. Well, let's move inland. Yeah, let's find a place for a campsite.
the tropical sky that night looked down on a ragged, sprawling little group of people who were blind to its beauty. In the deep sleep of complete exhaustion, they were also deaf to the wind and to the raging surf that thundered behind them, as if it had been cheated of its human prey. In the morning, the immediate concern of the party was food and water, and the harsh, forbidding land. The silent watching vultures seemed to know, seemed to be waiting. Feeling better? It's just like a nightmare. It's hard to believe it ever happened. Don't talk about it, Martin. We're on land now. Things will work out. I'm glad we're together. Seeking food along the beach, Kirk Hamilton discovered new tragedy. The lifeboat pounded all night against the rocks by the surf was a broken shell already bleaching in the sun. Meanwhile, John Hartley from a nearby hilltop stared in dismay across a vast expanse of shimmering, burning desert. No human being could hope to survive in this empty land of... But wait, was it a mirage? Or did that dark patch in the distance mean vegetation, trees? It must be, and trees meant fresh water. Not many, but it'll help. Did you find any fresh water? No. You have any idea where we are, Hamilton? Somewhere in the Dutch East Indies. It's typical of the Lower Island group. Barren, windswept, very little vegetation. Well, what are we going to do? Nancy. Mr. Hamilton! Mr. Hamilton! Water! I saw it from the hilltop. Plenty of it. Where? To the east, about 10 or 15 miles. Trees in a valley, a lot of them. Can take the boat to the other side of the island. It can't be too far inland. Well, let's get started. There's no boat. What? Smashed up on the rocks last night. But that shouldn't stop us from moving on. But with luck, we can make it over those mountains in one day. It won't be easy, but it's our only chance. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. All right. at the sight of the small isolated water hole, they forgot their weariness and dashed headlong to the precious liquid. But even wearier than he was thirsty, Shannon stopped in his tracks to rest. The others flung themselves feverishly down the slope to quench the agony of parched lips and swollen tongues, threw themselves avidly at the edge of the pool. Water. They plunged their burning faces to the wonderful water and drank with delirious joy. Elaine hurried with a brimming pail full to the exhausted Martin Shannon. Refreshed, their spirits lifted with hope hoped that they could conquer the desert and cross to the green valley beyond. Children know no danger. The whole earth is their playground, the world of living things their playmates. And what could be more fascinating than a tiny desert hop toad begging a little girl to come and play? Feel better? <laughs> Elaine, if... Uh... If what, Martin? Well, I was just thinking. If it wasn't for me, you'd be on the other side of the mountain. That isn't fair. Is it fair to the others? I know how you must feel, but you're tired. You'll rest when you get to the other side. Then what? You'll feel much better. Just wait and see.
Resuming their painful journey, they pushed onward immediately toward their original goal, the green country across the desert. They trudged on, footsore, aching in every muscle. Their torrid trail took them upward through broken, rocky wasteland, their bleary eyes searching the horizon for the telltale patch of green. The long day dragged on, seemingly without an end. Suddenly, across a ravine, animal life was sighted. This was the sign that Kirk Hamilton had been looking for. Where animal life could exist, so could men survive. It meant food as well as water. The little group pushed on with hope redoubled. As they plodded farther and farther through the sharp cactus, that hope seemed justified. The gaunt and cruel desert terrain began to change. Grass and trees began to appear and soon blended into the lush, rank growth of the tropical jungle. The sounds of birds and wind in green trees lifted their heavy spirits. Now, although Shannon grew weaker with every step, perhaps the worst part of the ordeal was over. They breathed new hope with the odor of growing things. From a clearing, the smoking cone of a volcano was seen towering against the sky. Kirk Hamilton knew then the explanation of the rich soil and fertility of the region. On these volcanic tropical islands, nature often provided food in abundance. And Kirk's judgment was correct. There, just ahead, was wild fruit and berry bushes, food at last. They rushed forward like any famished animals. As fast as their weary legs could carry them, they raced for the growing food with hungry eyes, as though fearful that the bounty might vanish like a desert mirage. Greedily, they crammed the tasty morsels, grabbing eager handfuls right and left. The simple fruits were the most royal feast they had ever known. Then, as the pangs of hunger faded, the little band of castaways relaxed. Despite the terrors they had experienced, secret thoughts of one another spoke in the hearts of Elaine and Kirk, and in Shannon's heart, bitterness and resentment. Even in the midst of their dreadful trials, the old human emotions made themselves heard. Here in the shelter of this natural garden, they finally made their camp. Meanwhile, the Hamilton Queen had returned from the East Indies to take Kirk aboard for the homeward voyage. Now Captain Talman learned of the battle with the pirates and the fate of his young friend. It was myself and seven settlers and Salty here were spotted by a merchant ship and picked up. And the others? Well, both ships were in flames. We, we saw them go under. What was your position at that time, Captain? Longitude 131 East, latitude 8 South. The lower part of the Dutch East Indies group. It's possible they may have drifted onto one of those islands in that vicinity. I wouldn't hold out any false hopes, Captain Tallman. Thank you, gentlemen, for the briefing. I think I'll take the clipper and do a little scouting in that area. If they made land, it's possible they might still be alive. Thank you, Captain. Right, sir. Mr. Davis, come on, Salty. Yeah. 
On the island, the castaways were drawing up their own plans for escape. A raft had been built, and a course was being charted. We'll shove off at dawn and set our course south. When we reach the point of Queensland, we should be able to make our way down the coast and back to the colony. You better gather all the food you can. You'll need it. I'll tell the others. Well, we're... We're shoving off at dawn. Home. I can't believe it. After all, Hamilton's a seagoing man, isn't he? He should know his business. At least we can be thankful for that. What are you thinking? I'm not thinking. I'm praying. We have plenty to do. Let's get all the melons and berries we can find. I'll help you. Is there really a chance, Kirk? It's our only chance. We've been here over two weeks now. Martin needs care and attention. Do you think he can stand the trip? He has everything to live for. As long as the good weather holds, we have at least an even break. Hey, Hamilton, come here a minute. John tells me we're going to shove off tomorrow morning. Now tell me how are the chances and tell it to me straight. Don't worry, Shannon. I'll see that you and Elaine get back. Ranging far inland, they collected all the food that the small raft might hold, preparing for the perilous attempt to sail home. They were certain that risking the sea on the frail craft would be the greatest challenge they had yet to face. Janice, honey, that's no way to be. We're going home now. Daddy were alive, he wouldn't. I know. Daddy would want me to be brave. That's right, honey.
mountains crumbled in glowing ruins. As in the grip of a hideous nightmare, they watched the white-hot river of lava that smothered the charred jungle like the molten marrow of the earth. Only as the dark sky began to gray with the approach of morning were they able to number the disastrous hours that had passed. And at long last, as the worn and beaten little group lifted their red-rimmed eyes to the dust-clouded dawn, the incredible eruption began to subside. The smoldering ruin of the shattered island was overhung by a giant mushroom of volcanic dust and ash, revealing the catastrophe far out to sea. We'll have that raft back in shape in a couple of days. Yeah. I hope you make it. Well, Shannon, you're going to be with us. Never mind that. Just take care of Elaine. Martin! Nothing could be alive on that island, Captain Tallman. Shall I set our course for home? Aye, Fuller. With a heavy heart, Captain Tallman gave the word to lower the flag of the Hamilton Queen to half-mast. Resigned to the tragic turn of events, he ordered the ship above. Unwilling hands turned the clipper back toward her homeward course. Kirk Hamilton was given up as lost. Look! Some people sighted on the lower part of the island. Short our course for the island, Mr. Fuller. We'll pick up the survivors. Oh, aye, aye, sir. Yes, it was these courageous Yankee seamen who conquered the dangers and the hardships. Men like Kirk Hamilton, who carried forward the dream of a nation and remade the plans of destiny to fit their own dreams. Dreams of home and hope and happiness in a new world of the future, a new world just over the bright horizon. Introduction. Two Lost Worlds is a 1951 independently produced science fiction and adventure B-movie, directed by Norman Dawn and featuring James Arness in an early role prior to his famed portrayal of Matt Dillon on Ginsmoke. Shot on a modest budget and runtime, the film encapsulates prevalent themes and filmmaking practices of 1950s-era genre pictures while also bearing the clear hallmarks of its low-budget limitations. It brings to life the fantasy of hitherto isolated, lost worlds, hidden from modern civilization, stocked with threats and thrills that would readily sate contemporary audiences' appetites for escapism and spectacle. As this analysis will elucidate, while Two Lost Worlds lacks originality and polish and relies heavily on stock footage, it nevertheless exhibits the core appeal and conceptual curiosity central to science fiction of the period. The film's usage of established genre tropes and cost-cutting tactics also serve as prime examples of how independent studios and directors marshaled limited resources in attempts to capitalize on popular trends and viewer interests of the time. While certainly no genre masterpiece, Two Lost Worlds ultimately provides an intriguing snapshot of how ambitious low-budget filmmakers crafted serviceable drive-in features for spectacle-hungry audiences. Employing tried and tested narrative devices and filmic shortcuts to summon alien vistas and bygone beasts otherwise beyond their modest means. Now for the plot summary. The film's premise centers around a fateful voyage of the 19th century American merchant clipper ship The Queen, bound from Shanghai to Hawaii with a crew of 30 seamen and its steadfast Captain Taylor, James Ernest. En route they rescue the survivors of a British scientific expedition whose ship wrecked onto treacherous reefs. 
But no sooner do they depart, a band of ruthless pirates covertly boards their own craft. Caught unawares, the merchant crew suffer immense losses and a surprise dawn attack by the marauders. Barely surviving amidst the carnage, Captain Taylor manages to trap the pirate leader John Morgan, John Harmon, and retake the bridge, forcing most of the pirates to abandon ship onto the island reefs. But not before they damage the Queen's rudder steering and render it dead in the water. Adrift and helpless, the surviving crew including Taylor, ship's doctor Dr. Webster, Laura Elliott, kind-hearted crewman Larson, Lori Mitchell, and a few other valiant seamen suddenly find themselves assaulted via spears thrown by an unseen party off the rocky island shores. Retreating in panic despite Taylor's protestations, the diminished merchant mariners abandon their floating fortress to make landfall just as aggressive natives attacks their landing craft. Taylor's leadership prevails against the primitive tribesmen through gunpowder and steel. Now stranded together deep in the remote island's interior, mysteries abound about whether other pirate and native threats lurk within the island's prehistoric-looking central mountain, dubbed Ghost Mountain. There too, legend tells of a lost Spanish galleon shipwreck named Diablo still laden with ink and treasure lying somewhere inland, sparking temptation. Reluctant to abandon their craft completely, a scouting party returns to the Queen and encounters a strange lower deck intruder in Lucas, aka Friday, a formerly enslaved ship's cook who long served aboard the same Diablo. Seeking refuge, the wary yet affable Lucas tells fantastical tales of barely surviving alone on this island for years amid vicious beasts and at the fringes of the aggressive native settlement. Eventually through trust and further conflict with natives, it is revealed that Lucas has been instilled as a translator and bridge between the tribal inhabitants and the dangerous pirate Morgan, who rules the natives through manipulation as he obsessively seeks lost ink and gold. This time we delve into the analysis, key themes and concepts. Two Lost Worlds features and builds upon several notable science fiction trends and archetypes that were widespread in the 1950s, illustrating how seemingly fanciful genre conceits often develop from and distill resonant contemporary themes and attitudes. The Lost World Fantasy The isolated island sanctuary harboring prehistoric beasts and tribal peoples reflects enduring public fascination with the prospect of geographically isolated lands where primeval ecologies persist safeguarded from external changes over vast epochs. This taps into the romantic, lost world mythos popularized by fantastical locales showcased in literature like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's 1912 novel The Lost World, or films such as the groundbreaking 1925 adaptation prominently featuring living dinosaurs. This fictional trope had its factual analogs in contemporary reports of curious undocumented ecological zones and so-called uncontacted tribes being newly uncovered by mid-20th century global exploration efforts into the world's remaining isolated wildernesses. Thus the central fantasy vision encapsulates the era's sense of wonder and promise over the scientific revelations such expeditions could yet uncover in remote corners of the world. Fused with a timeless sense human curiosity about inaccessible places where unknown flora, fauna, or peoples may persist. Now we tackle the pop culture allure of dinosaurs and prehistoric beasts. Complementing the remote island location, the most overt sci-fi element comes from the inclusion of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures wandering the isolated landscape. Brought to life through interspliced special effects footage excerpted from older films, this represents the immense public fascination and burgeoning lay expertise about dinosaur species sparked by paleontological discoveries of the early 1900s. With their sheer majesty and intimidation spurring visions of people interacting with such beasts across speculative art and literature. The iconic monstrosities proved inherently captivating to adventure tales and film, with animator Willis O'Brien pioneering stunning prehistoric visual effects in the original 1925 The Lost World. By the 1950s, dinosaurs had become an instrumental go-to spectacle for science fiction media, including recurring Lost World films like One Million Years B.C., 1940, Two Lost Worlds thus tried to capitalize on this bankable, proven formula. Beyond profit motives, however, the lumbering reptiles innately emblematized humanity's impulse to envision alien past eras starkly distinct from familiar modernity. Now, let's discuss tensions between civilization and the savage state. Additionally, the film's classic adventure storyline plays upon ingrained cultural perceptions in the Western psyche, both idealized and prejudicial, about so-called civilized, modern people encountering supposedly primitive tribes or environments. 
This includes racist colonial-era stereotypes of ignorant and aggressive natives being awed by the technology of enlightened yet overwhelmed explorers and empire builders. The movie leans heavily on this motif across interpersonal conflicts and cultural misunderstandings between Captain Taylor's crew and the tribal inhabitants, who capture and threaten the seamen before the latter gain tenuous acceptance after Taylor's forceful display of firearms. Lucas the translator acts as intermediary bridging the two communities' language and cultural barriers, illuminating potential paths towards mutual understanding, compromise, and coexistence. These interactions channel ideological assumptions underpinning colonial imperialist projects, notionally justifying repression or subjugation of local populations to serve the presumed aims of civilizing missions. They also convey condescension towards indigenous spiritual beliefs, portrayed as superstitious folk myths, versus empirical worldviews of seafaring American and British voyagers. The naive tribesmen worship Ghost Mountain where fearsome beasts are said to dwell, while the pirates manipulate such beliefs to maintain control, contrasted against the scientists and sailors seeking rational explanations. This signifies broader 20th century conceits of modern, industrial societies considering themselves intellectually and morally superior to backwards hunter-gatherer clans. Yet simultaneously, an unspoken envy and nostalgia exist for those living a primal, uncomplicated existence more in tune with nature versus increasingly urbanized lifestyles. Both sides exhibit distrust and presumed superiority amidst cultures in collision, but find themselves equally humbled when plunged into a hostile environment ruled by immense creatures from another age entirely. In this respect, despite leaning on prejudicial stereotypes, the film also resonates with insightful observations about human nature when confronting wondrous and frightening discoveries beyond the bounds of any one culture's accumulated wisdom. Now let's talk about analysis, production context, and filmmaking constraints. Positioned as an independent second feature, Two Lost Worlds was shepherded by producers seeking to make commercially viable genre pictures via formulaic adventure vehicles featuring bankable elements like Lost Worlds, Treasure Quests, Savage Lands, and Primordial Beasts to attract science fiction fans and youth audiences. Director Norman Dawn had already demonstrated a knack for visually capturing the allure of remote tropic frontiers ripe for high adventure and modestly budgeted spectacle pictures like 1934's Gow the Headhunter. Producer Boris Petrov in turn had success marshalling resources around fading stars to yield quick profits, evidenced by 1948's Jungle Jim knockoff Bamba, The Jungle Boy, which generated dozens of sequels throughout the 50s. Financial backer and co-scriptor Tom Hubbard helped fund several similar titles through his distribution outlet Hollywood Pictures Corporation, which exported U.S. genre films abroad, especially to Britain. There they found a receptive market as second features in Saturday matinee fare, essential revenue streams in an era before widespread television or home video options. As such, Two Lost Worlds was expressly designed to tap into this low-budget model, lean, formulaic, and derivative, yet just alluring enough. Now here is a further comparison of stock footage usage. The heavy utilization of stock footage for key visual elements was a necessity for ultra-low budget productions like Two Lost Worlds. Contemporaneous films face similar constraints, often intercutting pre-existing footage to depict spectacular scenes otherwise beyond their production capacity. This linked Two Lost Worlds with sci-fi slash adventure films like Lost Continent 1951, Prehistoric Women 1950, and other titles mining studio film libraries to summon fantastical lost worlds. And the stop-motion artists like Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen pioneered special effects animation techniques still being refined and sparsely used for the era's big-budget creature features. But affordable access to quality Dino visuals came via recycling footage like the crudely rotoscoped dinosaur battle from 1925's The Lost World, scenes from 1 million BC, 1940, and Unknown Island, 1948. Various 1950s sci-fi films inserting giant insects, lizards, or extinct mammals. Like its contemporaries, Two Lost Worlds used established footage of now-dated quality to infuse relatively mundane live scenes with spectacle, transforming modest tropical sets into realms of prehistoric peril seemingly beyond its modest budget. This trend saturated 1950s B-movies and even big studio films like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms 1953, which combined original effects with stock footage. 
So while sometimes jarring, splicing library material granted films like two Lost Worlds, narrative elements intrinsically linked to the era's popular giant monster and lost prehistory obsessions. Now, here's the breakdown of key scenes and plot points. The film features several pivotal scenes that provide insights into its broader themes and essential genre ingredients. Beyond simply propelling the adventure plot itself, analysis of moments like the following illuminates core assumptions. The outmatched crew's flight from tribal attacks presumes the savage native stereotype where spear-throwing tribesmen instinctively threaten advanced seafarers. But the tribesmen may have valid reasons mistrusting heavily armed foreign raiders disturbing their territory. In Lucas the Translator, we see sympathetic attempts at cross-cultural understanding. He bridges two worldviews, facilitating dialogue so the crew gain acceptance via gifts and demonstrations of strength that accord with tribal custom. But Lucas remains an accessory not an equal. The pirates manipulating local superstitions about Ghost Mountain shows contempt towards primitive belief systems, portrayed as ripe for exploitation versus the scientific empiricism the naval crew represents. Yet all parties share universal fears and temptations sparked by legend of gold and monsters. When creatures finally appear, the dated effects may convince no one, but they stir innate sensations of awe and insignificance when life from Ian's past suddenly crosses into the realm of modern men. As much as tribesmen or sailors try to dominate this dinosaur island, the primordial apex predators remind all humans they remain merely temporal visitors. Such micro-scenes, while advancing the plot, contain symbolic confrontations playing upon 1950s stereotypes and quasi-scientific visions of lost prehistory. Studying them closely unveils the underlying perspectives and sensibilities that power the pulpy tale. This time, about the socio-historical context. The early 1950s marked an explosion in science fiction media reflecting changing post-war attitudes. Technological wonders like space travel and atomic energy spurred both optimism and fear. Cold War tensions bred predictions of devastation contrasted against utopian futures. Mass media transmitted startling images of mushroom clouds, UFO sightings, rumors of aliens and moon missions, permeating popular consciousness. TV brought such images directly into American living rooms with sudden ubiquity that was unthinkable even a decade prior. Youth in particular embraced spectacular sci-fi scenarios. By 1951 quotas limiting imports of U.S. films into Britain had eased, allowing independent pictures to feed overseas demand. Genre movies blended real anxieties about mankind's destiny with sheer escapism full of monsters, heroes, and alien worlds catering to the era's fertile imaginations. It was amidst this convergence of societal worries, wondrous possibilities and insatiable public appetite that pictures like Two Lost Worlds thrived. They encapsulated both hidden terrors and transcendent potentials feared or craved when science raced beyond comprehension. Whether showcasing prehistoric anomalies, exotic cultures, or cosmic mysteries, such films channeled the 1950s zeitgeist, where reality could seem stranger and more perilous than yesterday's fictions. Now let's talk about granular analysis, set design, staging, cinematography. As a low-budget undertaking, the live scenes in Two Lost Worlds exhibit commensurately Spartan production values in their staging, set design, and cinematography. Yet even within these limitations, analysis of specific details conveys the conscious craft behind honing capital-efficient formula films of the period. The remote island settings rely on minimal dress sets blended with exteriors at California's Bronson Canyon and Red Rock State Park. Close observers may recognize the terrain from hundreds of westerns and adventure films seeking rugged vistas. Tight staging keeps focus on principal actors while background action adds dynamism. Scene blocking maximizes use of few extras, with native attackers emerging from behind rocks and bushes while bold camera moves track the dwarfed sailors fleeing across dramatic landscape map paintings. Violent native raids rely on quick cuts and sound cues to build frantic impact without complexity. Quieter moments feature sparse lighting and lengthy takes to soak in the island's tranquility before disrupted by fantastical threats. While budget-driven, such conservative visual approaches still demonstrate studied technique designed to meet audience expectations. The film condenses genre traditions into their essence, exotic. Hostile Edens that shock intruders with sudden attacks by primal peoples or prehistoric relics. This honed formula brought Lost Worlds to life just enough to spark moviegoers' willing suspension of disbelief.